8 Most Ridiculous Newcastle United Rumours That Never Happened Football without rumour is like a car without an engine. A hot air balloon without hot air. A bike without that annoying bell on the handlebars. You get the picture. Picture a transfer window where the rumour mill ceases to churn. The grapevine isn't bursting with juicy gossip berries and the hyperbole hurricane doesn't sweep through town causing wanton destruction at its every swirl. It would be awfully bleak, let's be honest. Thankfully, to our eternal peril, there is never a dull day on Tyneside and at the blink of an eye a rumor wildfire can spread quicker than Joe Kinnear can lose a phone or Alan Pardew can whip out a preloaded excuse in front of the cameras. Staying on topic, we've been treated to some humdingers in years gone by covering alleged superstar arrivals to St James Park and multi-million pound takeovers that have never come to fruition. Give me a football fan who doesn't love to speculate. With that in mind we've compiled the 10 most ridiculous rumours involving Newcastle that never actually happened. 8. Mick Harford and JFK Shadow Recruitment Team Joe Kinnear, amongst a plethora of verbose ramblings, professed to holding the key that could open any door in football and would use his power for the greater good of Newcastle United. Buying players proved to be an obstacle Kinnear, a close ally of Mike Ashley's, failed to overcome in the eight months he ran amok at St James Park with the title of Director of Football under his name and instead sought to employ his friends, carrying on the jobs for boys culture that had earned him the powerful post of our transfer mover and shaker. Mick Harford, a former Magpies striker in the early 1980s, was linked the role as Kinnear's deputy in a move to and fans feared would be the first phase of a shadow recruitment team coming together under our own roof having worked together at Wimbledon, Nottingham Forest and Luton. Thankfully it didn't come to pass as Harford came to his senses and declined the offer from Kinnear following a round of lengthy talks with his old chum and Ashley and took the assistant manager's role at Millwall instead. The human profanity generator walking the plank in February much to our devilish delight. 7. Jeff Sherd's Takeover Desperate to flog Newcastle to the highest bidder in the wake Newcastle's relegation to the championship in 2009, Mike Ashley was approached by Lancaster-based entrepreneur George Sheard, almost Shearer, to take the magpies off his hands and pip local Tyneside businessman Barry Mode to the post. As keen to run a football club, a source close to Sheard informed The Guardian. It didn't work out when he tried to take over Sheffield Wednesday but feels he has something to offer Newcastle. Has got serious backing and is in negotiations with Seymour Pierce. He might have harbour desires of taking over the Magpies but suspicions that Shear didn't possess the capital didn't fool managing director Derek Lambias. Although there was a rumor that he was just a figurehead for a shady collection of other interested parties, presumably American, and was putting no money of his own into the takeover bid. In the end there was no satisfactory conclusion to the takeover saga that gripped us for an entire summer. Ashley stayed, we went up and the rest is history. 6. Beckham for the tune. Arguably the most famous footballer to ever wear the famous black and white stripes and never actually play for Newcastle. Beckham was snapped in Afghanistan wearing our colours in Afghanistan in 2010 over four years after he allegedly held talks with ex-Magpies chairman Freddie Shepard at Claridge's Hotel in London. 
Shepard is said to have tried to tempt Bex, then a real Madrid Galactico, with a blend of romance and cold hard cash. Kevin Keegan's fabled no. Seven shirt was a veritable carrot wafted under his nose as was a lavish weekly wage of £120,000 that would have made him the Premier League's highest paid player, along with various image rights deals. And in our desperation to bring a commercially lucrative, high-profile name to St James Park in the wake of Michael Owen's injury, Beckham would have been permitted to commute via helicopter to Newcastle from his Beckingham Palace home in Hertfordshire. Unfortunately the story was quickly refuted by Simon Oliveira, his Spain representative, who told the Daily Mail, David and Victoria didn't meet with Freddie Shepard and they haven't discussed a move to Newcastle and declared that it purely a coincidence that Shepard was also there. 5. Is Tranquilo Barnett still in Jesmond Dean? Ask any Newcastle supporter where Tranquilo Barnett currently resides and they will probably reply with why the Jesmond Dean Hotel, of course. Barnetta, a Switzerland international, was a prominent name on the Tyneside grapevine in the lead-up to the 2011-12 season with the Magpies apparently earmarking him to replace Joey Barton on the right flank at St James Park and sparked a running joke that continues to be a great source of amusement for us, particularly on Twitter throughout the summer transfer window. Failure, to borrow a pardieu phrase. To get Barnetta over the line after he was rumoured to have met Newcastle officials at Jesmond Dean Hotel gave rise to a gag with numerous iterations that included the Swiss winger being held captive in one of the rooms or that he was diligently waiting for the Toon representatives to return with a contract to sign. It goes without saying that it was a completely fictitious but a piece of light-hearted humour all the same. 4. Samuel Dice's Casa St. James This has never been corroborated by the man himself but word on the street, or should that be the Mediterranean coastline, is that Dice bought a home on the Costa Blanca with the £4 million he acquired in the form of a payoff after being given the boot by Mike Ashley in January 2008. nothing out of the ordinary here you might think. Aging football manager buys a Spanish holiday villa near the ocean in preparation for his retirement and as a relaxing getaway for him and the missus at the end of another stress-inducing campaign. Well, that's only half of the story. Allardyce, an egregiously unsubtle character at the best of times decided to snidely name his new accommodation as Casa St. James in a clear taunt at the Magpies for the handsome kickback fund that landed in his bank account post-sacking. Galantry must be an alien concept to him. The utter, blood-boiling contempt of the bloated Cretan is too much to take. 3. Goodbye St. James. Granted this isn't a bona fide rumour but Newcastle came very, very close to leaving St James Park in the mid-90s as Sir John Hall pressed ahead in his quest to create a sporting club of Newcastle. With the expansion capital of St James restricted due to the adjacent Georgian Lees's terrace it meant the Magpies ran into difficulties as they attempted to revamp and modernize their prestigious home to move in line with the progress Kevin Keegan's entertainers were making on the field. Thus, in 1995. Hall submitted plans to relocate two pitch lengths away to Lees's Park and build a new £65 million all-purpose 55,000-seater stadium, while St James would undergo an extensive redevelopment in the view to being the new home of Newcastle Falcons Rugby Club along with the basketball and ice hockey teams attached to Hall's empire. 
Although the plans were initially welcomed by the city council, our original plan was to erect a 75,000 capacity ground at Gateshead's International Stadium, but the club quickly ran into opposition with pressure group No Business on the Moor gaining 36,000 signatures on petition, while it also stirred a political debate. Eventually it was decided to expand St. James and to this day we remain at our football cathedral complete with 52,000 pews for us disciples. 2. Real reason behind Alan Pardew's appointment. In the days before before his installation as Chris Hewton's successor Alan Pardew attracted just 14 votes from the 1,000 Toon fans who had voted in a poll on who they wanted as Newcastle manager. Not exactly the most popular candidate for the job. Needless to say speculation ran wild as to the motive behind Mike Ashley passing the black and white baton on to Pardew after cruelly giving the bullet to the popular Hewton with the official line from the upper echelons at St. James Park stating we required an individual with more managerial experience was needed to take the club forward. Suspicious were immediately aroused and the popular belief was that Pardew had struck a convenient arrangement with Ashley and managing director Derek Lambias to work off the heavy gambling debt he owed to the pair. That still hurts me, the casino tag, he revealed to the Daily Mail in his first major interview as Newcastle boss. I can be never bet in a casino, it tms just not something I do. Though it doesn't exactly dispel this particular myth well take part whose words were it on this occasion. 1. WWE meets Snuff. Probably the rumor every Toon fan and childhood wrestling enthusiast yearned for there to be a grain of truth in. As it was, we were sent hurtling back to reality from the top turnbuckle. It was way back in 2011 that gossip hit fever pitch as word spread faster than Lydus legs in a clinch with Edge that McMahon had designs on delivering a boardroom power bomb to Mike Ashley and seizing control of St. James Park with several hilarious theories sprouting as a result. Wrestling bouts on the pitch at halftime was a huge favorite of those mooted. While it was claimed McMahon harbored plans to move one or two of the Magpies fixtures to the United States. Official word from Newcastle was that it was a rumor without traction and so it lay dormant for nearly three years until it resurfaced in early 2014 when British website Winner Sports. K claimed the billionaire was sniffing around the club again as he sought to increase the influence of his WWE brand across the Atlantic. To our irreconcilable sorrow, it was completely debunked and we were left to wonder what might have been had the man with the most overly pronounced corporate power walk in sports entertainment added Newcastle United to his wrestling dynasty. Naturally the internet had a field day with those handy with Photoshop knocking up a bunch of humorous mock-ups, memes and wit-laden tweets. Torture on a level that exceeded that of a Bret Hart sharpshooter. EC Sports Pro Soccer Talk, meanwhile, came up some catchy catchphrases in its coverage with our favorite being the Hulk Hogan themed What you gonna do when Newcastle United runs wild on you, brother?